will listen quickly, I will speak quickly, and maybe we can move into some AC here very fast. I'm going to do a new sermon series for the summer. I think I mentioned this to you back in the uh, first part of the spring. The sermon series is My Mustache, You a Question. I mean, you remember that from the uh, Heritage Festival doing that. And I thought when I heard that, I thought, that is a great idea for a sermon series that there's so many questions in the Bible that are asked. And so these questions in the Bible are very serious questions. We need to understand the questions that have been asked in the Bible, but we need to make sure that we live the answer, so that will be the series. So today, the question is, where are you? Let me set the stage a little bit. I'm going to begin with a familiar story for some of you. Well, it sets our, our, our stage perfectly, so I'm going to go ahead and go. If you've heard the story, you've heard the story before. When Eric was in middle school, he loved to go to the football games. I think he was probably in seventh grade. He loved to go to the eighth grade football games. So I would come home, and as soon as I'd hit the door, he'd say, Dad, Go to ball game. So we got to the game one evening, one of the eighth grade football game we were watching. About time of the fourth quarter, getting close to the you know, middle of the fourth quarter, he said, I think I'm ready to go. And I said, okay, I am too. And so we walked out. As we were walking to the car, Aaron said, I think I'm going to walk home. Now at this point in time, the stadium, you know what the stadium is, and we live over on Five and a Half Street. Everybody know how far down. It's a pretty good little way. But just jokingly, he said, I think I'm going to walk home. And jokingly, I said back to him, okay, let me find a little So I got the car, car the car, got in the car. My intention was to round the block where that church is, the little church is over there by that parking lot, and come back and towards there and be standing there like, you know, come on, Dad, what are you doing? Well, I do. I circle the block. When I come back, there's no air standing there going, hey, Dad, you know, what's up? There is no air in period. So I'm beginning to panic a little bit. And I, I mean, I go back to the stadium, ask me, did Aaron come back in here? No, he didn't. I drive around a little bit. I'm looking, I went over to the first Baptist, where I was serving. See if he's going over there. I did everything I possibly could to find this kid who was nowhere to be found. Then I finally had to do the worst thing in this whole wide world. So I know what that was. Paul. Oh. I have lost so I did, I called the house, and kind of, you know, just bad as you know, type of conversation. I said, uh, Cindy, uh, you see Aaron by any stretch of the imagination? Um, uh, isn't he supposed to be with you? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right, we went to the ball game. Well, where is he? Um, I'm not really sure exactly where he is. He's not with you? No, he's not with me. I finally said, said he's here but he ran all the way home to the stadium because he said you left him i said well we were kind of joking around you know so of course i went on to talk to Aaron a little bit but Cindy's question is where is Aaron?" and my question kept being Aaron, where are you and it was a terrible feeling as a dad to have a seventh grade boy where you didn't know where he was of course, I got home and, and there's a dad. When you left, you went out of the park lot. I really thought you left me. All I knew to do was to run home. They ran all the way home to the stadium. So he was pretty tired of his office. So we just kind of looked at each other like, hey, I guess we need to be careful if you do what happened. <laughs> Something happened in the Garden of Eden. And God said to Adam and Eve, where are you? You look at Genesis 3 9, that's the scripture from today. But the Lord called the man. Where are you? So let's get this context. You know, you know the story. Satan misleads Eve regarding eating the fruit of the tree in the garden for which God has said, don't eat. Eve saw the food of the tree and thought it was very good and persuaded her husband, Adam, to join her in snack time. <laughs> Adam, come over here. Hey, this looks pretty good, doesn't it? Let's have a little bit of snack. Their eyes were open. They were aware of their nakedness. Then they go to the local home and garden store and they buy some fig leaves. So you know what they want to They sold the fig leaves together make an apron for themselves. Then they started a game of hide and go seek with God. Which leads to the day's question. Where are you? So now we've set the stage a little bit. We've talked about it. We've got it going. Let's talk about exposing the scripture. We now see the God who is creator as judge. So he's kind of having to put on another hat here, isn't he? God, the Creator, and now I have to 
becomes God the judge. He wants to interrogate the offenders. And who are the offenders? Adam and Eve. And he wants to do that to obtain a confession. But first, what does he have to do? He has to locate them. Where are you? Have you ever been at a place at a point where God was saying to you, where are you? You probably noticed in the scripture that God did more, did no more than be God. I mean, God never changes from being God. God is always God. He never changes. He never moves. He never does anything different. God never changes the status quo in our life. You ever notice that? How many of you know what status quo means? Status quo means the existing state of affairs. God did nothing to change the existing state of affairs. He did nothing to change the status quo. Who started the process to change the status quo? Satan did. <laughs> Satan started the process. Adam and Eve finished it. Well, what happens today in our lives when we change the status quo regarding our relationship with Jesus? Jesus doesn't ever do anything or change anything to affect the status quo. He doesn't change anything. So what happens in our lives when Jesus says, where are you? Something's happened in our relationship and you're not there where you used to be. It wasn't Jesus that changed the status quo. So we're going to look very quickly at four things that happened to Adam and Eve when they changed the status quo regarding their relationship to God. I promise you, you hear four and you're saying, really, four? They go, they go very quickly. Adam and Eve felt guilty and shame. Adam and Eve tried to change these conditions by their own efforts. Adam and Eve fled from God's presence out of fear of Him. And Adam and Eve tried to blame their sin on others rather than confessing personal responsibility. Let's look very quickly. Adam and Eve felt guilt and shame. Can you imagine? I mean, think about it. Can you imagine the shame and regret Adam and Eve lived with after they schooled by their sin the perfect creation God had made? Can you imagine how they felt? They lived in a perfect world, had perfect minds and bodies, and had perfect close relationship with God, but they were also given the freedom to make choices, just like we are. And when they chose to sin against God and disobey, it meant all of God's creation was now going to be subject to sin's effect. What is sin's effect? Disease, decay, death, separation from God for eternity. And every human being after what Adam and Eve did was born in this world with this sin nature, the natural inclination to sin. Now you'll probably admit with me, I would think that you would, we all feel guilt, feel some guilt and shame over some of our actions, and maybe for some of the things they're huge. Maybe for some things they're small. But in life, there is guilt and there is shame. Tina and I both love the Nana Berry drinks from the smoothie place, Smoothie King. I mean, if you've never been to our Smoothie King, you're local. If you haven't, you try it out. And I'm going to tell you what. Banana Berry Treat. Write it down. It's addictive to it. Now, some of you go, and I know you have your favorite. That's, Cindy loves it. I love it. And that's our favorite. And I highly recommend it. One day, I came home with one banana berry treat, and I had no intention to share it. Now, I want you to know. I felt guilty. And I was ashamed of myself. See, guilt is a bad feeling caused by knowing or thinking that you've done something bad or wrong. And shame is a feeling of guilt, regret, or sadness that you have because you know you've done something wrong. See, when I came home without that smoothie, I had a bad feeling that I'd done something wrong. I had a feeling of guilt, regret, or sadness because I had done something wrong. Now imagine, think about this. Imagine this. Something as small as not bringing home a smoothie made me feel shame and guilt. Imagine you are Adam and Eve, and you have messed up a paradise for everybody, not just for yourself. Think about it. Think that brought the shame and guilt to them? And you need to know something. Shame and guilt can't erase the action. Now, I guess I probably could have ran and got the smoothie for Cindy, but at this point, she would have said, the damage is already done. You already forgot. It's too late. Too little, too late. See, I could, I could have changed the deal. It wasn't going to change my actions. I couldn't change the fact that I had brought in this movie. But shame and guilt made me think twice about going home without that extra smoothie, didn't it? So I couldn't change the immediate action, but it sure could help me think about my choice the next time something like that came up. 
shame and guilt can prevent further action from happening. They shouldn't control their lives. A lot of people let that happen. The next thing you know, they're depressed, they're down, they, they can't function, they can't do anything on the shame and guilt. But one thing for sure, next time you get in that situation, you should think about your shame and guilt and say, you know what? Maybe, not maybe, I better not do this. So look at number two. Adam and Eve tried to change these conditions by their own efforts. When Adam and Eve realized their newfound nakedness, what did they do to follow the scripture? What did they do when they realized that they were naked? They tried to fix the problem. They sold the fig leaves and the aprons to cover themselves, probably, probably thinking God wouldn't notice. <laughs> oh, God will cover. Maybe he won't figure out what's happening and what's going on here. I don't know about you, but I'm a, I'm a problem solver. You try to solve problems, Adam and Eve solve problems. They tried to fix it and correct it. This past week, I realized my back porch had a hole in the top of it, and the shingles were gone, and the wood was rotten. I had a problem with water was going there. It was beginning to rot the wood. So I try to fix my problem. I either try to fix it until I fix it or until I break it and make it worse. And so this past week, got me a couple of shingles, got me a piece of wood, put up there, put a little shingle over the top of it. And as far as I can tell, I probably have at least temporarily solved that type of problem. I like to try to fix it and take care of it. Adam and Eve weren't seamstress. <laughs> Yet even though they realized they were naked, what did they try to do? They tried to remedy the problem as if God wasn't going to notice. See, when you see it, do you try to remedy the situation? Or do you call upon God to intervene? Adam and Eve could have waited on God and said, Oops, we've sinned and now we're naked. What do we do? And you know what? I bet God's solution would have been better than theirs. We try to fix things when our relationship with God goes bad. Allow God to fix He will do a better job. If you've got a problem in your relationship with God, don't try to sit there and work on it, work on it. I'm a problem, so I'm going to fix this problem. Go to God. God is a better picture than you are. Number three, Adam and Eve fled from God's presence out of fear of Him. The Adam and Eve had intimate fellowship with the presence of God before the fall. And since that time, sin has prevented our, our ability to be in the physical presence of God. The only ones that are in the physical presence right now are the sinless angels that are in the presence of God. But of course, we as Christians, we have the presence of God because of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, when I was growing up, my brother and I were famous, weren't we, Mom? Weren't we famous? We were famous when she was in there going out and talking about but you boys were. Y'all were so famous. I didn't love y'all. Y'all were famous boys. Here's what we were famous for when we were growing up. We were famous for breaking windows in our house. I said eight. Was it twelve? How many windows we break in the summer? Well, one summer we broke twelve different types of windows. And when we would break a window, I had a tendency to go high. I didn't like to face the consequences. My mom and dad weren't mean people. They weren't bad people. They weren't cruel. I just didn't like facing the consequences. My brother, he was one of those. He didn't care much about anything. He breaks out. He could walk in. He did you know, shoot out, whatever happened. Me, I go find a bush. And I go hide behind the bush. I don't even believe that. That was just me. I didn't, I didn't want to do that. I didn't like doing it. I feared the consequences, so I hid. Does that sound familiar? A little bit like our story today? See, any believer knows that there are times of spiritual leaning. There are times we've done things in our lives that we know go against God's standards. We all do it. Remember the sin nature that we got from Adam and Eve? See, there is a reverent fear of God that draws us close to Him. That's a good thing. When you look at God in a reverent fear type of way, and that draws you close to God, that's a good thing. But there's a fear of God's response to our disobedient beings that makes us run away from God. That's not a good thing. God never wants us to leave from His presence. Otherwise, He would have sent Jesus to rectify the relationship between us that was brought on by Adam and Eve. God always wants to be present in our lives. It doesn't matter if we're sitting or not sitting or have problems or complications. God wants to be there. He wants to be a part of our lives. Don't run from God out of fear. Always go to God, no matter what. See, we learned this from Adam and Eve. God wanted to be with them even though they even though they did something they weren't supposed to do, God went looking for them. Look at number four. 
Uh, as the tried to blame their sin on another rather than confessing personal responsibility. Anybody ever been here before? Have you ever played the blame game? I mean, you, uh, you don't have to confess that. Ever. All of us have played the blame game. If you look like, if you were like most people, you would probably acknowledge having, at some point in time, used a scapegoat from time to time. Like, we just do it. A few of us really want to admit we actually have a habit of blaming others for our mistakes, but we do it. See, Adam originated this game thousands and thousands of years ago, and since then, we've been working to master it, that, the blame game. And the truth is, we don't like to admit when we're wrong when we're caught. Isn't that right? I didn't when I was a kid. We like to shift the blame to someone or something else. Over the years, Sid and I both have been stopped by police officers for moving violations. You don't have to confess here. I mean, you've never been stopped before by a police officer for a speeding or something along those lines. Sid and I both, we would admit, we've done it over the years. We, we've been stopped. And there was a period of time, for some reason, especially when we lived in Texas, when I would be stopped by a police officer, I would just tell go out, uh, yes, sir, I'm the assistant minister of music over the first Baptist Pasadena. And he would say, okay, Mr. Durden, now, just keep your speed down. And he would walk off. Cindy would get stopped, and of course she couldn't say anything like that, and she would come home with a ticket. And I'm just going to tell you, she was not a happy person when I was using the pastor minister card and getting out of tickets, and then she would come home and she would have a ticket. But think about it. When any of us have stopped the speeding, what do we immediately do? We look for excuses, and I've done it. I have every excuse in the book, such as, uh, officer, I was going with the flow of the traffic, why? Like everybody else. Or, officer, uh, I didn't see that sign noting the speech chain. We're blaming it on something else. We try to excuse our behavior, lessen the guilt, and even the consequences of our sin and our behavior. But unlike us, God is not fooled. And He sees past our attempts to hide our mistakes. God does not want us to use our past, our friends, our family members, or stressful circumstances, excuses to misbehave. When we constantly make excuses for ourselves, you know what it does? It short circuits what God can be doing in us to minimize our, our situation and to make us effective for Him. When God discovered Adam and Eve in the garden after they had eaten the forbidden fruit, He asked why they had been disobedient. What did Adam say? These are famous lines. Everybody knows these lines. You can probably repeat them with them. If God finds Adam and Eve after they've been disobedient, what do they say? Let's get to the, the first one. What did Adam say? The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate. When Eve was questioned, she responded, The serpent deceived me, and I ate it. But despite their attempts to shift the blame, what happened? They were still held responsible for their actions because regardless of the influences that led them astray, they made the choices. They could sit there all day and have say, the woman made me do it. He could say, Satan made me do it, but you chose. You had the choice. James 1, 13, 15 says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting you. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away in heart. Then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin when it's full grown, gives birth to death. We all make mistakes. But when we do, we need to recognize that blaming other people in circumstances can't absolve us of the guilt we face. Only the blood of Jesus can. Only when we realize and say, I made a mistake, I blame anybody else, then the blood of Jesus can cover. Let's go back to the broken window for a minute. I love right, blaming my brother. I did. I did. I love saying Ken did it. Ken did it. Ken did it. I loved it. It was, it was awesome. And in one case, it really was Ken's Ken fault. I mean, it was really Ken's fault. We were playing baseball in the backyard, pitching the ball, and hitting the ball, and we would throw and the batter would swing and miss the ball and hit the bricks on the back wall. Mom remembers this. And Dad came around the corner and said, Boy, quit throwing that ball like that. You're hitting that back wall and you're going to knock those bricks out. But you think about it. I think that means we could have gone I mean, if we're throwing a rubber ball hard enough and hitting some bricks and my dad's coming out 
out saying, you're going to knock those bricks out, we can start calling, didn't we? I think we're going to go off road. He can't sit there for a minute, scratch his head, and you know, a light bulb. Now, if we can't have a light bulb, I, I probably should have ran. He said, hey, you know what? If we get a bicycle and put where the catcher would be, we would throw the ball and stick the bicycle and it'll stop the ball when we hit the brick wall. Well, I went along. I probably thought it wasn't a very smart idea, but I went along. We put the bicycle there. He and his back around the back. His brain got he reared back and he blows that ball. And it didn't hit the brick wall. Success! Except we hit the tire on the bicycle and we also broke the window. So whose fault was it? His fault. It was his brain job. I had to take some responsibility. Don't play the blame game with God. He knows where the blame belongs. Let's put it all together. Shame and guilt shouldn't control you. Many people live for years with shame and guilt, allowing it to make them ineffective. But shame and guilt should be used to keep you from making your mistakes over and over. Number two, when you mess things up, don't think you're in life alone. Don't try to fix things yourself. Christianity is a two-part relationship. It's you and it's Jesus. It doesn't matter how bad the mistake, allow God to work in your life in a new situation of the grief. Running from God out of fear only makes things worse. He doesn't want to be separated from you. He wants to be with you. Number four, don't blame others for your mistakes. Own up to them. God knows all and sees all. He knows what you've done. Very quickly, I want you to think for just a few minutes. You've been kind of going off for a minute. Come back to me. Let's apply the scripture to our life. Just take a few minutes and just think about it. So Adam and Eve, where are you? God said. So, where are you today regarding your relationship with God? Are you living a life that is overshadowed by shame and guilt? Are you trying to fix things in your relationship with God and not realizing He is the major relationship fixer? Are you hiding from God, not experiencing His presence due to fear? Or are you blaming everyone else in your situation? Where are you in your relationship to God? I want you to know something. Know that God took the initiative. God went seeking out Adam and Eve to reestablish a relationship with them. I'm going to close with this very short illustration. How many of you know my little precious fairly, my granddaughter? How many of you know they'll be here this next week? And JD. Three weeks went for them, and then we'll have Angie for a week. We're going to be a grandparent heaven. When Fairly stayed with us this last summer, many of you will remember we kept kept it for a while. The fairly was staying with us last summer in the house for just a few minutes, she disappeared. And Cindy couldn't find her. Of course, we have a pool in the backyard. If you can't find the kids in our house, you can if the idea that there's a pool back there. And so Cindy is panicking because for a few minutes she can't find Fairy. And she starts calling her friends, Fairy, Fairy, where are you? Fairy, Fairy, where are you? And finally, within a few seconds, it's probably like long, probably was eternity for Cindy. Cindy, all of a sudden, out of the room, there comes a cry and boo hooing fairy. Woo! A, just cry, she, but she, she heard such a seriousness in Cindy's voice. Fairy, where are you? And Fairy hears Cindy's voice, and she thinks, I'm really in trouble. She comes around the corner, she gets a cry and boo hooing. Of course, Cindy is relieved. Here's my precious fairy. She's just around the corner of another room. When we are in the presence of God, I'm just going to tell you right now, we should cry. It is the worst place to be not in the presence of God. Maybe the question isn't where are you, but are you where God wants you to be? Where are you? Are you where God wants you to be? That's where joy and life comes from. Isn't it, isn't it really everything else? Think, it makes you think it's going to be joy and, and happy. The true joy in life is being in the presence of God. Ask Adam and Eve how miserable it is to be out of the presence of God. That's what that was like. Isn't that true? Adam and Eve, where are you? Being out of God's presence. It's miserable. The joy of life is found in being in the presence of God. 
I showed up for God saying to me, Carl, where are you? I wasn't saying, Carl, you're right here. Hey, you're messing up. You're making problems. There may be complications. There may be things going on. But Carl, you're here. And you know what? This last thing you messed up on, we're going to work on it. We're going to work on it together. And I'm going to work on it in your presence. I'm going to be in your life. And I'm going to help you. Don't run from me. Don't be ashamed. Don't fear me. Don't blame others. We're here together, Carl. I'm, I'm in your presence. You're in my presence. We're together. I don't want God's name where are you. I want to be in this prayer. I pray and hope that you will too. Father, we come before you.